All right, what's up you guys? Jeff Rowe back here again. So this is the K5 Blazer that we intend to put a roll cage in over the next few weeks. Uh, this truck came to me from a friend uh, and it had the uh, links from off-road designs already on it. Man, what a fantastic kit that is. This is exactly the way I would build a Blazer for myself if I was going to do one for myself. Uh, but this happens to be a customer's I'm just kind of jealous of. Already got a big bad motor in it, all that good stuff. I just needed the shocks set up properly and I did that over the last few weeks. I didn't get the opportunity to film that for you guys, but I'll show you some in the end of what it looks like when we're done. Now, uh, figuring out how you want to do a roll cage, all right, I recommend, uh, you know, getting in touch with the sanctioning body if you plan to race your vehicle. Otherwise, following the rule of some of the larger sanctioning bodies, i.e. SCORE, uh, you have your KOH, uh, King of the Hammers guys, the Ultra 4 stuff. You can follow their rules if you're building a 4x4 or best in the desert. All of those you really can't go wrong. I'm a big proponent. I like 2-inch tube for my mains, and then I will usually use something a little smaller to do the webbing and things like that. So that's kind of the concept. Uh, but there are wrong ways to do it and right ways to do it. And I intend to try and show you the right ways to do it. So, first things first, the interior is still in this truck. I need to get the dash out of the way because I have every intention of punching through the firewall and running my roll cage right out to the front of the truck. That way the entire thing becomes a chassis. By the time we're done, I don't want my cab making noise against uh, steel, uh, rubbing against tube work, things like that. So when I'm done, the cab itself will be tied directly into the cage so that the entire thing is one structure. Ideally, what you're looking for in these environments is, all right, long-term durability. So if you're going to build it out of a, a light material like a hot-rolled electro-seam tube or something like that, if you roll it, you're only going to get a one-time use out of it. You're most likely going to bend that tube. However, it is uh, May 2021, and the price of 4130 is through the roof right now. So I don't plan on using that anytime soon. DOM, also known as drawn over mandrel, tends to be the go-to tube for these types of environments. It's a seamless tube. It's been drawn over a mandrel, so it's perfectly round, so on and so forth. All right, it has uh, great, uh, great characteristics as far as that goes. Uh, and, and more importantly than the material choice, though, is the design itself. A solid design will outperform poor design, obviously, but it will also perform well with less than ideal uh, materials. So uh, I'll be using DOM, have a rack full of it in there, two inch with some inch and three quarter, an inch and a half, so on and so forth. And that's what we intend to do. So I covered sleeving. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a little clip about that uh, after this. So I need to get the dash out of this truck. Let's go. Guys, make sure that uh, you hit the stationery store and you find yourself a combo circle template maker. Trust me, this thing will be like your best friend sometimes. It's getting old, she's broke. I've had this thing almost 10, 11, 12 years maybe. Lifesaver, because it'll set you up with crosshairs so you can find the center of a circle, but you can also use it for layout. I intend to put a tube right inside the dash right here. And if I want to do a little bit nicer job, I can take this, I can set it over there. It'll tell me where to put a hole saw. Then I can punch it with a hole saw to give me a nice radius, even though I'm going to end up slicing it so my tube top and bottom fits. Check it out. Now, the part of what I'm doing right there, all right, is I'm going to set that tube in a location so that when I run the tube through the dash, I'm going to have enough clearance right next to the door sill here to actually 360 degree that weld. Uh, you don't want to find yourself in positions where you can't even reach a place to weld. Or uh, if you have, there have been times I've cut this whole door sill out uh, just to get into a weld, and then I put that door sill back in. Uh, that's a choice you can make, but ideally part of your layout configuration depends on you, the uh, fabricator, deciding, hey, 
Do I want to be able to reach that weld or not? Yes. Yes, you do. You don't want to leave anything unwelded. Bottom line, 100%. Probably without a doubt one of the hardest things and why most people skip it, punching through that firewall right there. So I got lucky this is an older truck, there's nothing in the way, some modern automobiles inside the cab, you're going to have all kinds of air conditioning vents and things like that. Uh, you the operator are going to have to decide how you want to contend with that because I will not sacrifice my safety for a little bit of convenience, simply won't happen. You must move those things. Get them out of your way or engineer your roll cage around that stuff. No, I don't do that. All right. I'll move that stuff around my roll cage so that I can maintain symmetry and integrity. So keep that in mind. And when I'm setting myself up, guess what's going to go right here? A sleeve. What's up, you guys? Uh, something I'm going to cover uh, before we really get started in the uh, roll cage and bending and all of that, all the tube work uh, concerning this blazer that we're about to do, um, is I want to cover something that I think is important, all right? And that is the proper way to do a sleeve, all right? There are a lot of different applications when you're doing a roll cage uh, that you can save yourself a lot of hassle by learning the proper way to sleeve tubes. Now, in the off-road world here, uh, we keep it pretty simple, right? We use standard sizes for our tube, uh, and usually if you use like a 120 thousandths wall tube, which is the most common roll cage uh, structure, there are others you can do, and we'll get into compression and uh, loads versus shear loads and things like that in a little bit. But uh, something that's important to me and something I think that a lot of guys overlook is the proper way to do a sleeve, and the applications for how to do a sleeve are actually abundant. All right. Uh, not only when you exit the cab and you're not ready to do the whole back half of the truck, you can cut it off right there with some rosette holes. If you're not familiar with what a rosette hole is, that is a rosette hole. So the proper way to do a sleeve is you take the next size down diameter tube. When you're working with a 120 thousandths wall tube, the next size down is going to slip fit fairly easily. So as you can see, these fit together pretty nice. I do like to clean up the tubes. Obviously, cleanliness is next to godliness when it comes to welding, so that's part of that application. Uh, but I'm, uh, there are plenty of guys out there showing you how to weld and all of that, so I'm not too concerned with that. But I will show you my tricks, my techniques a little bit later on. Um, but uh, something that's important when doing a sleeve, uh, the applications, like I said, tie rods, we do it all the time. All right, I do a slip fit to fit a much larger rod end, things like that. Uh, because I can't afford to have it machined out of like 4130 or things like that as well. So uh, poor man tricks, I guess, is what they are. Uh, but exiting the cab out the back um, so that you can uh, do the back half of your vehicle later, so on and so forth, as long as you do the rosette holes a little bit early. And I like to do a rosette on both sides. That way I can weld that in when I'm all done. The other side is the sleeve itself. All right. Now, when it comes to these, uh, I think about three inches approximate. I know there's an equation that goes with it. I don't know that equation right off of hand. Uh, so you might have to cut me a break on that one. Or if you want to look it up uh, so that you can put it in my notes and make me look bad, that's okay too. So, um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how to do a proper sleep. So let's get down to boogie on it. You always want to make sure that you bevel the edges so that it slips in fine. Try not to leave that square. Also, I'm going to get into some uh, loading ideologies and things like that uh, as far as the tube work goes. So we'll explain that in a minute. All right, you guys. So I went ahead and cut my sleeve piece. All right. And just so you can see, 
one and a quarter tube. All right, that's one, one and a quarter. This is inch and a half. All right. And with a hundred and twenty thousandths wall, they will slip fit each other. So, now, keep in mind, some manufacturers make their materials at 125 thousandths. And if that's the case, you're going to need to remove a bit of material off of your sleeve to make it fit. All right. So, I'm not really holding machinist tolerances in here uh, for this type of application. Uh, so, a simple Harbor Freight style uh, dial caliper should let you know what you have things like that and it'll be quite useful i also use this for scribing tools thing uh, things like that scribing materials but just so you can see i'm at 123 thousandths right there so this is actually 1.252 that's why i had to remove material all right so you can see this material 129 i think it have a bit of a burr right there all right. Yep, 123 thousandths there. Now, you'll notice, whoops, wrong end, excuse me. Noticing that these two slip fit well. All right. However, oh, 90 wall tube, 90 thousandths is going to be a sloppy fit. So the application here is not what you're needing. So for most of your main structure, you're gonna, gonna, gonna wanna go with 120 thousandths. However, if you're putting tubes in compression and things like that, uh, some people wanna use 90 wall, so on and so forth. I'm not innocent of that. Um, as long as it's in compression, it's uh, considerably stronger. And I'll show you guys a trick later on uh, that we did in elementary school where I learned about tubes and how compression works as far as they're concerned. So. So uh, when you're slip fitting tubes like this, something I highly suggest you add to your inventory, all right, is a carbide burr bit like that. Something like that is going to be a lifesaver. Of course, they make barrel sanders. You can even pick these up at the uh, Harbor Freight or any of those, all right, or the high-end ones, all right. Jag 10 Tools has uh, all of your abrasives for these, and these are awesome. I use them all the time. But this tends to be a lot more universal, right? So. Not only can I clearance the inside of my material if I need to. Which is something you would do with a barrel sander, the same. But this removes material much more aggressively. So, when I need it, it's there. All right. Proper way to do a sleeve, obviously, always bevel right. the tube as well. All right. That way, your weld has something to lay down into. Obviously, just welding on the surface of anything is just going to leave a large profiled weld uh, that usually lacks in penetration, things like that. Uh, you always want to think of this stuff in terms of, of energy and energy distribution. When building a roll cage, say you're in an accident, all right, you want to imagine where the impact is going to happen and how you're going to distribute that load through the chassis. All right. And the chassis is important because you don't want sheared, broken tubes flying around inside the cab with you while you're in the middle of an accident, right? Uh, that is kind of the concept that most of this works on. And most of us in the off-road industry, that's the idea behind what we're doing. Uh, we could get in a little more technical as far as DOM tube, 4130 tube, things like that. Um, but that's not my concern. It's May 2021, and the price of 4130 is through the roof right now. So I don't think that I'll be using that for any projects in the coming future the as of right now. to do this sleeve. Obviously, I've covered the material thickness and things like that. All right, is to assemble it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to push my sleeve in until it's about halfway, at least somewhere to get that rosette weld done, right? Now, I can mark it. If I'd like, all right, I cut this at just over uh, three inches, so I have an inch and a half in each side, and I'm pretty much right there already. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw the tack in the, uh, in the rosette hole. To hold my thing in place, all right. Next, put the other side together assemblies like this uh, you want to try and stay focused on on the details right details matter so you want to line up your holes 
your rosettes, all right, plug welds, whatever you want to call them. That way it looks more professional in the end when you're done. Um, so now this is all done, I would lock it in place. Uh, but I don't finish weld anything until I've completed the entire assembly. That way I don't have any, any uh, <laughs> defects or things that I need to change. Um, the, the difference between an amateur and a professional is a professional knows when to say when, when to stop. And I've had to do that over the course of the last 20 years, more than a few times, and throw it away, right? I might have spent five hours building something. If it's wrong, it's wrong, and it's not useful. So don't waste any more time. Learn when to say when. If it's bad, throw it away, all right? So I'm going to lock this in place. I'm going to weld it up. Completed assembly, should look something like that. All right.